Our friends, Scott and Trina, had a little boy when another baby boy was born. And when they took three-year-old James to the hospital to see his baby brother, he pointed to his little brother and laughed. It was like, there really is a baby. You, you told me about it, and th there really is a baby. He was just so amazed. He pointed to his tiny little features, pointed to his ears, his nose, his mouth. He pointed to and touched his little fingers and toes and laughed some more. James' amazement over his little brother reminds us of the wonder of life, the sheer miracle of another little child being born into our world, and the wonder of God himself, our amazing creator. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Consider the words of God to Jeremiah. When God first called Jeremiah to serve him as a prophet. Notice in Jeremiah chapter 1, beginning with verse 4, in verse, or in verse 4, the Bible says, The word of the Lord came to me, came to Jeremiah, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. What an amazing revelation from God. Before you were born, you were in my heart. I knew you. I anticipated your life in ministry. I already appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah is in awe and afraid. What could this mean? Me? A prophet? No way. Notice his response in verse 6. Ah, oh, Lord God, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you. God was saying, don't minimize your significance to me. I have a plan and a purpose for you and your life. Isn't he saying the same thing to us today? Don't minimize your significance to me. I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. Notice verse 8. God goes on to say, Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you. Notice God's promise. I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Now that word rescue doesn't necessarily have positive connotations. God's rescue implies there will be trouble. You can read Jeremiah's story in his book. He was a man who ended up getting into plenty of trouble. He was persecuted for his faith. His life was threatened. But God was with Jeremiah as he promised. God preserved his life through tough times. He blessed Jeremiah's prophetic influence. And, God, and his ministry continues to bless students of the Bible to this day. And before all that, before all that took place, God knew. The Bible teaches that God has foreknowledge. One of the evidences that the Bible comes from God is prophecy and the fulfillment of prophecy. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, prophets were able to accurately foretell certain things taking place beforehand in the future. One example is the miraculous birth of a precious baby to a virgin girl in Bethlehem, David's city. Jesus' suffering and death, also foretold ahead of time, is an example of fulfilled prophecy. The Bible teaches God had a plan for the Messiah, and God had a plan for Jeremiah. Jeremiah was told, before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. Before I was born, before you were born, I set you apart. And Jeremiah's experience is not unique. God told the prophet Isaiah to tell his people, I am your creator. You were in my care even before you were born. I like what Rick Warren says. You are not an accident. Your birth was no mishap or mistake, and your life is no fluke of nature. Your parents may not have planned you, but God did. He was not at all surprised by your birth. In fact, he expected it. You are alive because God created you. Psalm 138 verse 8 says, God will fulfill his purpose for me. Wow. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me and for you. The Bible teaches God is our friend. He is our Savior. And the Bible also teaches He is our Lord. We're accountable to Him. 
long before you were born, God had a plan and purpose for your life. His plan is that you will have a better life through following him. His purpose is that you will have a more abundant life now through grace. But there's more. His plan is that you experience eternal life. He plans for you to enjoy life in God's paradise that he will restore in the very presence of God. You're significant to God. The Bible teaches even before you were conceived by your parents, you were conceived in the heart and mind of God. Psalm 139 speaks of us being fearfully and wonderfully made. It describes God actually seeing us in the womb and having a record of our lives before we were born. Considering this, considering God's intimate and amazing relationship with us, David says at the end of Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, Search me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Discern, discerning God's understanding of his whole life, along with his love and care, David cried out for help and salvation. Can you identify with him? Can you identify with David in his prayers? Him calling out to God for help? Calling out to God for salvation? God is our creator. He is our God. He can and does help us. He helps us all the time. In telling and retelling the story of Jesus, we testify how God came into our world through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Mysteriously, God also became man. Jesus became part of the human family. And even though Jesus has returned to his rightful place with the Father in heaven, he keeps reaching out to us as our friend and Savior through the Holy Spirit. I like what the book Steps to Christ teaches about us having a relationship, a personal relationship with God. Page 93 says this, Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are. I mean, he already knows us. He already knew what we would be before we were born. No, not that it is necessary to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to him. Through faith and prayer, we can be spiritually lifted up into the very presence of God. Through prayer and God's word, we can experience God as our friend. Before the cross, Jesus said in John 15, 15, and 16, some really heartwarming words. Jesus said to his disciples then in the, and disciples now, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. You did not choose me. Jesus went on to say, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Jesus is our friend. He is our Savior, and he is our Lord. He chose us. He has a purpose for our lives. When you accept to follow him as a disciple, he appoints you to go and bear fruit, the fruit of making other disciples. Before his return, Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go. Go mentor others. Show others what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I like this, this definition of discipleship that we're going to put up on the screen. Christian discipleship is being mentored to trust Jesus daily while he shapes your life and sends you to disciple another. In discipling others, Jesus says, baptize and teach them to obey everything I commanded you. Jesus is our friend and our Savior. He's also our Lord and God. Colossians 1, 15 and 16 confirms this. The text says this is amazing about Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, by Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and earth. Then the end of verse 16 says, all things were created by him and for him. Verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Amazing. Jesus is our friend. He is our Lord. As our creator, he is truly God. 
Do you know what Doubting Thomas said when he finally saw Jesus after the resurrection? When he saw the nail prints in his hands and the scar in his side, he cried out, my Lord and my God. Jesus is Lord. There's a little song that teaches he is Lord. Maybe we should sing it just now. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes, the Bible in Philippians 2, 10 and 11 tells us, the day will come when every knee shall bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That day is coming. But what about today? Jesus is Lord. Are we worshiping him as Lord, obeying him as our God? Consider with me two areas in our daily lives where, where we can show, it provides us an opportunity to show Jesus is Lord. I'm thinking of the areas of time and money. In the areas of time and money, we communicate priorities in our relationships. We show our love and loyalties. That would be true in a marriage relationship or relationship between a parent and a child. But it's also true how we spend our time and money impacts other relationships as well. This is also true in our relationship with Jesus. Consider, first of all, the area of time. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus extends an invitation for us to come to him in faith to spend time with him in our daily lives. He says, come to me and find in me rest for your souls. Right after this invitation, Jesus tells a story. The story in Matthew 12 is about the disciples spending time with Jesus. They were walking with Jesus through the grain fields on a Sabbath. And undoubtedly, they talked as they meandered along, enjoying the uh, company of Jesus in the warm, fresh air and the the uh, warm Middle East sun. Because the disciples were hungry, they, as they were walking along, began picking some heads of grain and began eating them. Well, this situation gave some legalistic Pharisees reason to accuse the disciples of Sabbath breaking. And Jesus very pointedly took exception with their interpretation of the Sabbath. And in this setting, he declared himself Lord of the Sabbath. Notice Matthew 12, 8 in this setting. He said, if you had known what these words mean, Jesus said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. In declaring himself Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus is declaring himself Lord over creation and Lord over time. At the very heart of the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath speaks of the Creator's authority over time. The commandment says, Six days you shall do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work. When Jesus said he's Lord of the Sabbath, he's identifying himself as the one who created the earth and gave us the Ten Commandments in the first place. He is the Lord our God. Jesus is the one for whom we work, and put aside our work. We keep the Sabbath as holy for him because he is holy. In Jesus, we have the very one who gives Sabbath rest. In the New Testament book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9, it says, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. In Hebrews 4, Sabbath rest is linked to salvation rest. It's the rest that Jesus promised in Matthew 11 when he said, Come to me, and I will give you rest. He promises rest for our bodies and rest for our souls. After declaring himself Lord of the Sabbath out there in those wheat fields, Jesus went on to heal a man with a shriveled hand. Now, it was Sabbath. And as on other occasions, Jesus was ridiculed by his critics for breaking their Sabbath rules. Once again, Jesus asserted his lordship over the Sabbath. 
with authority. He said, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, Lord of time, and how we use our time, what we do as well as what we don't do. I'm accountable to Jesus for how I spend my time, and not only on Sabbath, but every other day of the week. Remember, the fourth commandment addresses the other six days as well. It says, six days you shall labor and do all your work. We're accountable to God for our work, for the purpose he has for our lives. Many of us could testify from experience that it actually takes some work to rest. Whether that's a nice vacation with family or fun day with friends, often it takes a little extra work, some preparation to quote-unquote rest. That's true of the weekly Sabbath. It takes some work. It takes some planning ahead, some preparation in order to not work and run errands and shop and do the usual things that we get caught up with from day to day. It takes some planning and preparation to rest and worship and do good for others on the Sabbath. Disciples today can benefit from the example of the 12 disciples and Mary and other women and followers of Jesus who intentionally put aside their usual work to sit at Jesus' feet, apparently at times for days at a time. Can you picture them resting, enjoying his company, treasuring his presence, his teachings. You know, most of us live pretty busy lives. I think a lot of us would say that. And then if you add in internet, computers, social media, cell phones, TV, tablets, and the latest electronic innovation or device, it can just go on and on. Think of all the time and money spent on entertainment and sports. And surely there's a place for quality entertainment, and there's a lot of good in sports. But let's not confuse entertainment with worship. Sabbath provides time for us to turn off the TV, put aside the newspaper, the news magazine, whatever. We're invited to turn off the blaring music and blaring sports and games of the world and seek to connect with heaven's voice, God's word, his songs. Sabbath gives us time, gives us an opportunity to, to cultivate our appetites for, God, appetites for God and the spiritual work of his kingdom. Sabbath provides an opportunity for us to walk and talk and minister with Jesus. I was listening to the pastor of another denomination talking about how fragmented our society has become. And he spoke of the difficulties we're facing in experiencing quality time, meaningful community with God and others. Do you ever wonder if Sabbath is becoming for Adventists what Sunday has become for most other Christians? Just another busy day where we go to church? Where it's pretty much business as usual for the rest of the day? A day that further fragments our lives instead of bringing health and wholeness in our relationship with Jesus and others? Jesus says to believers, come, come to me, come to me, and I will give you rest. I am Lord of the Sabbath, Lord over time. The place God has in our schedules, the place he has in our use of time is an area where we can have an opportunity or we have an opportunity to show that Jesus is Lord, Lord of our lives. He's my pilot, not my co-pilot. Josh is an airline pilot who says flying was his passion from a very early age. He was determined that he was going to fly before he could really even walk. In fact, he got his private driver's license, or got his private pilot's license before his driver's license. It's pretty amazing. He went, to Walla Walla, or he went to Andrews University because they have a flight program there. And he ended up marrying a pilot. To say that he loves flying is um, an understatement. He was always determined that he would be a commercial airline pilot. But he was also raised to keep the Sabbath. And as a young adult, he realized that there are few Adventists in the airline industry because of the Sabbath. It's an industry where it's very difficult to get Sabbath off. But Josh figured God needs witnesses for him in the air as well as on the ground. There's an old bumper sticker that reads, God is my co-pilot. And Josh has said, I don't really agree with that level of self-sufficiency. He believes that's just saying, God... When I can't handle the control panel anymore, then I'll let you take over. Josh says, I think God wants a little bigger role than that. He wants to be my pilot, 
and I will do whatever he asks. Now, one thing God asked Josh to do was to keep the Sabbath. And he tells a story about how keeping the Sabbath and his lifelong dream to be a pilot came into conflict one week. A number of years ago, he was planning to complete his training at a well-known airline company. And he had been assured there would be no classes or teaching instruction on Saturdays. But one day, his instructor announced there would be a Saturday class and everyone was required to attend. Now, in the airline industry, if a student misses a class, he's out. Josh knew if he missed this class, his dreams of becoming an airline pilot would be virtually thrown away. Boy, did he pray. He prayed. And he admits he even wavered a little, rationalizing that, well, this training was just as important on Sabbath as any other day. It looked as though he was going to have to choose between the Sabbath and his lifelong dream. But God had other plans. Josh says, I quote what he says, God has magnificent powers beyond all human comprehension. The week dragged by slowly. When on Friday, the director announced the impossible, there would be no class the next day. The teacher's pregnant wife had gone into premature labor, and while baby and mother were fine, the class was held the next week. Last I heard, Josh is happily employed with that airline and has had numerous chances to tell other pilots about God. He says, I quote, The Lord has rescued me many times from having to work on Sabbath. He's promised if he commands me to obey me or to obey him, he will make it possible. He says, God is my pilot. If I just let him be my co-pilot, who knows where I'd be today. Now, not everyone's experience is so positive. Many of us know people who have lost jobs and suffered hardships because of keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath reminds us he's Lord over money as well as Lord over time. Truth is our commitment to Sabbath keeping can touch our wallets. A pastor friend told Peggy and me that when his father became a Christian, when his father accepted Christ, he also came to accept the Sabbath. And in making a commitment to keep the Sabbath, he lost his job. Now, our friend says his dad got another job. God took care of his dad and mom and their family. Um, Years later, you know, fast forward years later, both of their sons are in full-time gospel ministry. All their children are, are, are grandchildren, are Christians. And our friend says his father doesn't have any regrets for what he lost when he became a Christian and been keeping the Sabbath. He is so thankful for all he has gained. But the, the, the deal is, his dad never again made as much money as he did before he was a Sabbath keeper. Never again did he make as much money after he began keeping the Sabbath. But God blessed in so many ways, so many other ways, that he is so grateful for what God has done. Still, this, this area of money is an area in our lives where we can experience Jesus as Lord. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus also said, you know this verse, many of you, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Many of us can testify how our faith has grown by putting God first in how we spend our money. God has touched our hearts as he's been touching our pocketbooks. Through the years, I've heard people say over and over again a similar testimony when it comes to stewardship. A while back, there was a a pastor who said, it took me a while to learn the value and blessing of writing out a check for tithe and offering first instead of waiting till later. By waiting, he said, there wasn't always money left over for tithe and offering. But he learned by giving to God first, and many of us have experienced this, by giving to God first, there always seemed to be enough for what his family needed. In Malachi 4, the Bible teaches us to test God. Test God in this. Check God out in this. See if he will not bless you, even opening the windows of heaven so much that there's even more than you really have room to receive. Eugene Peterson is a pastor, or Eugene Lewis, that is, is a pastor in Seattle. He's someone Peggy and I met years ago when we took some classes together. Eugene tells a story about when he and his wife were in college. And as college students, they were struggling to, in, to make ends meet 
but they determined between the two of them that they would return tithes and offerings. He says he learned a lesson of the importance of faithfulness one winter day. It was December 23, two days before Christmas. Early that morning, Eugene's two-year-old son asked his daddy, Daddy, where are the Christmas presents that are supposed to be under the tree? His big brown eyes and tender voice broke Eugene's heart. After returning their tithe and offering, there was no money left for Christmas. They were even $200 short for rent. What was he to do? How do you tell a two-year-old there will be no presents for Christmas? His heart ached. At the time, he was working as an assistant pastor in the Oakwood College Church. And he went into the sanctuary, and he says he got down on his knees and prayed to the Lord like he had never prayed before. He prayed about how his call to ministry was embarrassing him before his family, how he needed $600 to cover rent and Christmas expenses, and that if God didn't supply the money, he needed God's strength to face his family. That night, the senior pastor invited him to a Christmas party which Eugene was in no mood to go to. Still, the pastor encouraged him to come by the office. He gave there in the office Eugene some words of encouragement and handed him an envelope, which he put in his pocket and pr promptly forgot about. It was 10 o'clock that night when he finally went to his car to head home. And he said the cloud that had hung over his head early that morning was heavier still. It was very, very heavy. He was really feeling defeated. It was time to face his family, and he was going to have to do it empty-handed. As he got into his car, he says, a voice spoke out of nowhere, Eugene, the envelope, the envelope, open the envelope. He opened the envelope and, to his surprise, found $600. God arranged for the exact amount he prayed for, as he puts it, in spite of my failure of faith. Malachi teaches us to return tithes and offerings because God is Lord. He claims ownership over our lives and our money. It's not just that the tithe is his or the candlesticks that Eddie was referring to earlier in the story in the call for the offering today. It's not just that the tithe is his. The, the candlesticks are his. We are his. We belong to him. And God delights in taking care of his children and their needs. As Malachi encourages us, test me. See if I will not bless you. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm sure there are many people here today who have tested God when it comes to tithes and offerings. And you can testify today that he has been faithful, that his word has been sure, his word, his promises have been true. He is Lord. Do you believe it? What matters is whether he is Lord of my life, Lord of your life. Is Jesus your Lord? Does it show? Does he know? Would you like to say, I choose for Jesus to be Lord of my time, Lord of my money, Lord of my whole life. Is that your desire as we bring the service to a close? Let's stand as we pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for Jesus. We praise you that he is our friend and he is our Savior. He is also our Lord and God. Oh Lord, help us to understand more fully what that means, how that impacts our lives, that you have a plan and a purpose for us that touches every aspect of our lives, including our time and our money. Oh Lord, we would just pray that you would come anew into our hearts and there are some here today who are still on a journey of coming really to know you as a friend and a savior. We just pray that you'll draw near to each one, that you'll meet us truly where we're at, that we will experience you as you would have us to experience you, that we would see and know your faithfulness, and that we'll be careful to give you all the praise for being so faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.